Last week, we closed our discussion of the way by showing one of Andrew Wyeth's paintings called Wind from the Sea. It not only shows us a way as we gaze through the window across the field and towards the sea, but it also puts us in mind the spirit Jesus spoke of to his disciples as he prepared them for his departure. A mysterious wind lifts the curtains, curtains whose base ends in single strands of light, suggesting a mystical presence. Now, if we look more closely, we see that there are birds embedded in the fabric of the curtains. And the most visible and obvious one is silhouetted right against the way that we see in the distance. Now, Andrew Wyeth was not a professing Christian, but his paintings frequently suggest a spiritual presence. They have a mystical, mysterious quality, which he deliberately cultivated. I don't think it's going too far to suggest that he had the Holy Spirit in mind as he painted this scene, gazing out towards the distant sea and the path that led to it. One of the most frequently used images for the Holy Spirit in art and in scripture is a dove. Here are a few examples. Fra Angelico, in a scene of the Annunciation, shows the hands of God in the upper left corner of the picture, from which issue golden rays as he releases the dove of the spirit, which we see in the air just above Gabriel's head. The same dove appears in Van Eck's Annunciation scene, and the dove of the spirit descends on Jesus at his baptism in this fresco by Piero della Francesca. These are just three of the countless examples you can find of the Holy Spirit depicted as a dove in works of art. I think Wyeth is deliberately suggesting the presence of the spirit in this scene of the wind. And after all, the word for wind, breath, and spirit are the same in Greek, pneuma as in pneumatic and pneumonia, and in Hebrew as well, ruach. Wyeth was not unaware of these nuances. Let's take a look at another of his works tellingly entitled Pentecost. We see nets lifted by a breeze and are reminded of the nets the first disciples left behind in order to follow Jesus. Many of Wyeth's pictures depict scenes of the sea and coastline of his beloved state of Maine. Just across the channel from his home in Maine, there is an island, pictured in the background here, now called Allen Island, but which was once called Pentecost Island by the English adventurer and explorer George Weymouth, who made landfall there on Pentecost Sunday, 1605. Wyeth's wife actually purchased the island in 1979. Now, there are many ways to go about featuring an island in a painting, but this isn't one of them. It is depicting nets being lifted by the wind by the Spirit, the same Spirit that came upon the believers on Pentecost so long ago. I love the way Wyeth alludes to the Spirit without being obvious. His work is always enigmatic and open to interpretation, but I don't think we're wrong in saying that this is another of Wyeth's meditations on the presence of the Spirit, just as we saw it in wind from the sea. Jesus has been telling his disciples about his departure and about the spirit of truth who will come to them when he has gone. He calls this spirit the paraclete, the advocate, a legal term for the one who quite literally is called to be alongside a person to help and advise them and often to speak for them when they are in legal difficulties. Jesus tells his disciples in John 14, 26, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. 
This is given special relevance when you consider the two other lectionary texts for this Sunday, chapter 17 of the Book of Acts, which is Paul's speech before the Areopagus in Athens, where legal deliberations were held, and chapter 3 of the first letter of Peter, where he tells his readers, always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. This is an image of Paul speaking before the Areopagus. It is taken from a cartoon by Raphael. A cartoon, in this sense, is a preparatory sketch created for tapestry workers to use as a basis for their weaving. Pope Leo X had commissioned Raphael to create a series of designs, that is, cartoons, to be made into tapestries for the Sistine Chapel. They were to depict various scenes from the lives of Peter and Paul, and one of these scenes was of Paul's speech in Athens before the Areopagus. This, that you're looking at now, is a painting made much later, faithfully based on the cartoons that now reside in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Here is the actual cartoon, but since it is quite faded and harder to see, I've chosen to use the painting which was made later by an English artist, Sir James Thornhill. You can see Raphael's love of classical architecture and his vibrant use of color in the robes of all the characters in the scene. In the right upper half of the painting, we see a statue of the god of war, in Greek, he was called Ares, hence Areopagus, the hill of Ares. But he was called Mars by the Romans, so this scene is sometimes called Paul's speech at Mars Hill. And Areopagus is not only the name of the hill, but also of the council of elder, elder statesmen who met there to deliberate the most serious judicial matters. Paul is very deft in his approach to the Athenians gathered before him. He compliments them on their spirituality, as he has seen shrines to gods everywhere he has ventured in the capital, and he has even come across an altar dedicated to an unknown god. Paul uses this as a springboard, sensing that people who are so interested in things of the spirit that they would even have an altar to the unknown God, will surely be interested in hearing about the great, transcendent deity whom Paul worships, a God who is pure spirit and who cannot be captured in a statue made of metal or stone or wood. He reminds them that their own poets have alluded to this very God who is intimately close to each and every person. As their poets said, and Paul quotes them, in this God, we live and move and have our being. Now, the Athenians were a deeply sophisticated and philosophical audience. They were accustomed to discussions about the nature of reality, the immortality of the soul, the nature of good and evil. And as Raphael depicts them, we see that some are scrutinizing Paul with interest. Others are pictured with eyes downcast, deep in thought. And some appear skeptical or even a bit wary. The gentleman in the lower right, with hands open and receptive, echoing the open-handed gesture of Paul, is thought to be Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus who came to faith after hearing Paul preach. And the woman, seated next to him, is said to be Damaris, a woman of Athens who also came to faith at that time. Paul is in the process of doing exactly what Peter suggested in the lectionary text I quoted earlier. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you yet do it with gentleness and reverence. The Athenians wanted Paul to explain himself formally in a judicial setting, and so he did, with gentleness and reverence, 
with eloquence and clarity, and with respect for his listeners. He had taken the time to study their habits, their beliefs, their poets, their culture. And that attitude of openness and receptivity earned him the right to be heard. Certainly, we can all learn from his example. Paul could also speak with confidence, not because he held a high opinion of himself as a speaker, but because he knew, as Jesus had assured his disciples in Luke chapter 12, when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. It seems to me that Paul's Athenian audience is very similar to people we meet in every walk of life. Many of our friends and acquaintances are sophisticated and perhaps jaded or wary when it comes to discussing matters of faith. And yet I have never lived through a time when I sensed such a deep longing for spiritual connection, for something real and truthful on which one could base one's life, an anchor that would hold. For me and for many who are watching this video, God is that anchor, and Jesus is the way. It is his spirit who is our advocate, our guide, our compass, through all the wind and weather and waves we meet along the way. I'd like to share a poem with you that I think speaks of the longing people everywhere have, especially during this tumultuous, highly stressful time for safe harbor and real connection. It's called A Noiseless Patient Spider by Walt Whitman. Noiseless Patient Spider. I marked where on a little promontory it stood isolated marked how to explore the vacant, vast surrounding. It launched forth filament, 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 out of itself, ever unreeling them, ever tirelessly speeding them. And you, O oh my soul, where you stand, surrounded, detached, in measureless oceans of space, ceaselessly musing, venturing, throwing, seeking the spheres to connect them, till the bridge you will need be formed, till the ductile anchor hold, till the gossamer thread you fling catch somewhere, O oh my soul. I think that like Peter and Paul, we are called on to offer hope to those who were casting out their threads, their lifelines, hoping against hope that the line they send out might catch on something, something that would give sense, give coherence to their lives. We believe and put our trust in a transcendent God who loves every single human being beyond measure. In the person of this loving God, our anchor holds. This is the hope that we have to share with others. I love the resonant words of the Book of Common Prayer when it says, We most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Never has life seemed more transitory than it has in the past two months. And oftentimes it is we ourselves who are the means God uses to convey his love and comfort. The Spirit, our advocate, will be with us if we call upon him, and he will inspire in us the right words, the right way to bear witness 
with humility and love to the reality of Christ in our lives, and more importantly, will give us the right attitude of respect, sensitivity, and compassion for others, which alone gives us the right to be heard. And perhaps it would be good to recall the words attributed, rightly or wrongly, to St. Francis. Preach the gospel at all times, if necessary. Use words. <laughs>